Thank you. Uh, good evening. This is the Lake Forest Park City Council Budget and Finance Committee. Uh, before we have the agenda and uh, just review, we have a new business uh, marriage proposed revenue projection for 2025, 26, and levy consultant update. Do I hear any changes to suggestions or changes to the agenda? Not hearing any. Um, may I have a vote of adoption of the agenda? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing that, it passes. Uh, let's see, the committee, uh, on the public comments, the committee is not accepting online public comments, and this portion of the agenda is set aside for public comment to address the committee on agenda items. Comments are limited to three minutes. Do we have anybody who would like to make any comments? Hi. Hi. I don't know how to do this. So you have three minutes, and you can, um, you can, hear yeah. me. We can hear you, okay. if you like, state okay. your name. Okay, hi, my name is Sarah Phillips. I'm the chair of the Climate Action Committee. And uh, this is a group of nine citizens, and I just want you to know they are the, we are lucky people to have the kind of talent that's available to us. And these people were fabulous. Um, and as you know, we put together a climate action plan and uh, we created and submitted it and you accepted it. I don't need to remind you of that, but I'm going to. Um, and um, I just want to say that I, uh, this is not my first rodeo with like first part budget. I know it's constrained and partly I don't care. <laughs> I got an agenda here. I think, um, you know, uh, I just wanted to remind you that you accepted this document. And if you put it on the shelf, if you put a policy document on the shelf, that's where policy goes to die. And um, I want to encourage you to take it off the shelf and to figure out how we work together. Because we've adopted, you all have adopted goals, separate and apart from the climate action plan, but included in it, which is the reduction of em emissions by 50% in six years. Um, so we have to figure out how to do that. And I think by accepting these goals, you have said to us, that you agree with us that we need to reduce emissions, enhance the, eco, 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 uh, the environment, and um, increase, re excuse me, resiliency. The Climate Action Committee recommended a full-time staff person, but we still believe that's what we should do. Somebody who gets up every morning and says, how can I assist the citizens of Lake Forest Park, reduce their emissions, build resiliency. I understand their constraints in the budget, um, but, so the question I want to ask is how do we reach those goals? If we have the same goals, we've accepted them as policy documents, and we're not in the budget, how are you going to move on the goals? Um, how do we ensure that the commitments you've made both to the county and to the region and to your citizens that you will do what you said you would do, which is um, reduce emissions, um, uh, enhance the ecology and building resilience. And I want to tell you one thing I know, no, two things, maybe three things. It's not going to be cheaper next year. It's not going to be easier next year. Um, and um, there's a piece of me that doesn't want to give say this part, but there are things you could do that are hurt full time. I was very disappointed that we missed the opportunity to, work, to apply for a civic spark which was an 11 month internship for $30,000. That opportunity passed by. Um, but I think there were also, we can look at part-time shared um, uh, shared positions. Um, and I know that puts, uh, I don't mean to suggest that I think there's somebody here who has 50% of their time where they're you know, eating pie. But the question of how you allocate your resources is a critical piece. And I think I think you need to think about that seriously, and we, the Climate Action Committee, is eager to work with you to figure out how how to make this work, and to figure out what you how how we continue to do meet the goals of, of uh, emissions reduction, resiliency, and ecological sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other individuals for comments, so we'll close public comments. And we'll move on to our new business, which is 
the uh, mayor's proposed revenue projections for 2025. So I'm going to ask our clerk, who's already done it, to just go ahead. We're going to refer exactly to the document that everybody already has in their hand, page 26. Starting, um, well, actually, it starts, I will say, on page 25, um, the revenue policy. But we're going to just walk through the numbers together. You will see on page 25 that there's some notes on kind of how we've come to some of these uh, estimates. So trend analysis, if it's an economist estimate or actuals based on actuals. And so we've tried to put the method within the document to help tell the story of how we're, we're looking at the revenue projections. And so with that, I'm just gonna walk right into it. And just, we're gonna go through every single fund that we the city has on the revenue side to walk through what's in the actual revenue numbers. Are there any questions on that before yeah. I start? Just as uh, I can imagine, there's going to be quite a few questions. And if the uh, council members would uh, please take a moment to be recognized, I think that will help our discussion. Absolutely. So um, the general fund's taxes, um, and then the general fund, I'll just, if it's appropriate, I'll just stop after each section to make sure that everybody doesn't have any questions. So the general fund, taxes is our largest uh, component or category. Um, that the city brings in within the general fund. And within that is the property tax. And within the property tax, every single year, we will have a a hearing, um, a public hearing on the what we define as the 1%. And so there are, um, you, within this mayor's budget, uh, it is a, making the assumption that uh, the city will elect to do the 1% for the next two years. Um, within sales tax, this is just simply going on trend. Uh, the affordable and housing, again, just the actuals of what we're receiving. Criminal justice state, that's associated again. It's tied in with sales tax. Uh, the business tax, that's based pretty much on the actuals of what we're, the trends of, of what we are receiving. Um, and then the utility tax, I want to make sure to take a, a moment to say the utility tax, this is different than the utility tax that's specifically associated with sewer and surface water that's outlined there on its own line item. The utility taxes are like 6% for the telephone and some other taxes that the city collects that are all lumped into the one, the one bars code, one code right there. And then the utility tax, the, the sewer and the surface water. So um, those are directly, their revenue to the general fund. They are revenue, the rate payers do pay an additional 6% on their sewer and their surface water bills. Um, and that becomes revenue and expense within that fund being the sewer fund or the surface water fund, which then generates revenue and ends up in the general fund. So uh, leasehold excise tax, I'm just gonna take a moment to share on that uh, because it's so such a small dollar amount. That was associated to having a tenant on the lakefront um, property. We had a rental there that we were renting to him for a very uh, small amount, but when the city receives money, they also have to pay um, an excise tax a leasehold excise tax on the money that they're receiving. So um, although that is showing at zero um, with the new, dis uh, the decision of, uh, oh my goodness, purchasing that <laughs> Rose property, I was like, oh my goodness, that will then, we will see a number in there. So that's going to actually change. But I just stumbled all over that. You did. You did. <laughs> Okay, so then walking down to the admissions tax, that is admissions for um, for adult entertainment within the city. And then going down, oh, I said I would stop at each section. Are there any question on that section before we walk to the next and go to licensing? 
Absolutely. So, so the property tax, that's a component. And you're so we assume that it's just one percent increase. So uh or the, that comes out later, right? It comes out at in after December and December. So we will go into great detail um in, in our public hearings on the property tax. But for this discussion, this is two years worth. Mm -hmm. So don't forget that it's two years worth. Um, and the one person, there are a couple components that go into property tax. New construction um, is a one-time infusion of money that you you have your your basically 30, 33, 34,000, which is about the 1% that the city will receive. You'll receive that. You'll receive the, any form of new construction. There's, I believe it's utility, and I'm sure I'm going to miss something. And then we always we always estimate high because we're dealing with very preliminary numbers when we approve our intention. Um, and so we create and adopt an ordinance that uh, basically shows the city's intention to increase the 1%. That being said, we cannot be low. If we were low, if we estimated right. low on that dollar amount, that would be the cap of which the city could receive. That's why, and I have a great little table that when we start discussing this, it's the what was previously the additional 1% and it's broken out on each piece. And then I also provide the preliminary that we receive from King County in order to back up to help walk you through where each number came from. Okay. And then literally flat a line that says estimated high, like the estimating high rounding up. And it's just literally outlined very clearly on a table. And then we'll walk through that, um, you know, as your property values go up, it doesn't necessarily mean that the if your levy rate is going up that it will right. go down because you can only receive that one percent okay that helps are there i just don't want to okay so walking down into the licenses and permits um this is where the city brings in the business licensing, construction permits, land use permits. Those are like the planning permits, um, plumbing, mechanical, concealed weapons. This is just the basically the licenses and the permits that come in for the city. Um, and so um, that pretty much sums up that group of um are there any questions this one's pretty absolutely why why are they lower in 2025 than they are now so plumbing mechanical and because uh within 2023 and 2024 um this goes directly back to working with calvin so i uh, on some of these, basically these construction permits, and I work with uh, our community development director for land use, and they provide the numbers to help us build what they accurately think we will bring in. Okay. I definitely want to make note that, um, you know, we have had some some higher years, and we thought it was a little bit of a, 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 a real one time we do think that's going to carry a little bit and show up um, in some places and maybe not others. So we're thinking that we had unusually high plumbing permits coming in. And so, again, these numbers were provided directly from the experts in their field. Um, and so that's what he thinks is a true, accurate estimate for the plumbing and the mechanical. It's number one. It does is that reflected then in the credit card fee number as well? Yeah. Is is it's coming off of those transactions? So if if we're not receiving higher dollars, then then that's it directly associated with the credit card fees that we will then be receiving for the larger plans. Thank you. Well, is it accurate to say that if you're given a range for what, for instance, the construction permits might be, you'll put the lower end in here just to be a bit more conservative when planning the budget? 
th that tends to be Calvin's. I've worked with him enough to know <laughs> that that is always what Calvin tends to do. Um, and which I think being on the other end at not here at this city, but at other cities, I think it's, it is always the safer place to be. It's always a much easier conversation to come back and say, Hey, we are outperforming our number versus the opposite of which I had to do when I first got here. And actually at my first mid buy, we were so off target from our construction permits that we amended a huge chunk of money out of that construction permit because it was telling a very false story. That is not a boat I uh, desire to be in again. Um, because that's an uncomfortable conversation. And um, then I, you know, having that conversation with Calvin and I did find past documents that backed up exactly what he was telling me of the number that was much more true to accuracy. So I listen when he, when he speaks. I just wanted to make a point that 2324 is projected. That's what we actually brought in, not what we budgeted. And so there are a lot of long times. You've got a lot of large buildings. That come in. And if you look at trends, which we tend to do, that's not following the trend. So this is actual, not projected? The 23-24 is projected, projected through the end of the year. Oh. It's not what we budgeted at the start oh. of the year. So you're seeing some increases. Okay. The, looking at trends are definitely long time. Okay. Are you allowed to say what the meds are? That's working out. Yes. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I think I can. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, Safeway, okay. Chase Bank. I mean, you got some big. You guys, I think you have to leave it open. Well, it's like it's yeah, locked. and it's it's coming. Yeah. It's coming yeah. through the wall. They're right. they're right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's not going to help. Not going to help. Okay. Anyways, I just wanted to point out that these are, this isn't what we budgeted for twenty three. That's so true. Realizing. Yeah. Any other comments? Possibly we don't get Oh, just missing. So this was a blip. On a trajectory, this yes, this bump by any of it. You're if you got, continuing the trajectory. You have a few years years of flips, <laughs> and you start to go, okay, maybe this is a trend. But this okay. one year to, to project up that, um, it's not fiscally not yeah, responsible. Appreciate that. And so, we I, just as a standard practice, I'm also going to say that. Our philosophy is to err a little bit more on the side of caution, because again, the conversation of having to say, hey, we were overconfident is a much harder conversation than we were conservative on our on our estimates. And um, that's just, I guess, a, a budgeting philosophy, however you want to state that. I just am going to share that. So. OK. OK. Walking into intergovernmental revenues, this is the one where you're going to see a lot of, okay, we had some projections and now we have, uh, you know, there are a lot of one-time funds, there are a lot of grants, there are a lot of things being received in. Um, you're going to see the WASPIC traffic safety grant, less than lethal. These are like one-time, um, the bullet proof vest partnership that is actually a federal grant that we get on an annual basis so that's more of an ongoing and that's actually an actual number that's been provided but a lot of these are are pretty much one times um so that's where you're going to see the the zeros moving forward um the EMPG grant that is one that we receive in and then we split that we receive about 20,000 ish 22,000 ish a year and then we split that and we pass it through with Kenmore. So you're going to see that expense later in department presentations. Um, behavioral health grants, these are all things that the police department has brought forward. And then you've got some, again, back to the one times, the Blake reimbursements. That's a, that, a, again, I we believe at this point is a one time. Um, there's, there's always. Is everyone familiar with the Blake? Okay, that's a, a good reminder. Um, and then I am going to point out uh, Department of Commerce, the, the GMA um, comp plan grant, that is a huge number for uh, 
for this budget. And so I want to remind that there's $500,000 associated with the climate aspect that the council has actually already approved. And then the other 25 is for middle housing. So those are grants that the city actually already has. And so that is where the 525 that we didn't just pull that out of a hat. It's an actual um, multimodal criminal justice, uh, special programs. Those are all state shared revenues. Uh, MRSC puts out a calculator. So those are pretty well outlined for us. So we don't, they pretty much give us the number that's gonna be really close on 2024 or 2025, the future year. And then we do a little wiggle for 26 and we call it good. And so then walking down um, again, uh, some of the trends, the liquor excise tax, tax is actually trending down a little bit where like the liquor board profits is trending up. And so this is where I'm paying, pay attention to some of those things to make sure we don't, we aren't being a little overly confident. Uh, and then it, we also do believe this was a, a interest, a interesting note that um, Corey wasn't sure she was anticipating that one of the grants, um, the waste reduction recycling grant, she wasn't confident that that was going to be a program that was going to be carried forward. And so we just left it out to be safe. If that is a program that then is carried forward and will be within 25, 26, we'll amend it in. Or if we know more information at the end of this year, if that's going to be a continued program. Again, if we're unsure or don't know about something, in my opinion, um, we always leave it out because it's easy to walk it in, with especially on grants with pass-throughs. Can you clarify the difference between the liquor excise tax and the liquor board profits? I thought I knew the difference, but I'm not sure. I think it's it's just two different categories that um, I would have to go do okay. some research to, to yeah. give you the true split on exactly the verbiage of how it's. Yeah, I remember it was like bottles sold versus like selling liquor. I'm business, sure this, but I can't, I can't remember off the top of it. Right. I'm sure it is. It is something. Yeah, I'm sure it is something that clear. I just can't remember. I think it's just I'm just going to say also I'll have to circle back on that one. Because there was also was there an updated uh, law that um, they could serve liquor in adult establishments now. So yeah. that could be something that could have a positive impact that we don't know what it might be I see. at this point. I wouldn't fact that they need, in, but I would an yeah, economic what happens. impact that yes. So I will make note of that to to circle back. Um any other questions before I turn the page? No. Okay. So then walking uh general fund charges for goods and services, everything that you see in there for inner fund service from that is what we that is cost allocation that's what we call cost allocation and that is done in two different ways we have a policy it's set for for ftes and how our ftes split out so when we talk about like for example myself phil we are charged to the general fund but the other funds do pay for a portion um, of specifically things that it seems appropriate for them to pay for like our a portion of our time etc. There are other things that are um, less, I'll just use a straight example from my department, file local, our business licensing and business tax software that you can file through. That's not appropriate to share with everybody because that's a true general fund expense. The, the revenue is coming in and the expense needs to be paid for out of the general fund. So that's very black and white, but there are other things that that do get shared. And so this is from basically every fund, including the transportation benefit district down there towards the bottom. So um, that is pretty much that. And um, then walking through the development tech surcharge, printing copies, there's some nominal things. We don't ever want to hope or see that NSF fees are going to be increasing. Um, that's, that's, not, that's not good in the finance world. 
Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Non-sufficient funds. That's a good thing. I probably should actually um, break that out. So it's that's any time a payment is returned. So whether it's in the form of a check, whether it's in the form of a any form of card that doesn't actually go through and it gets rejected and then ends up going through and then coming back, um, the city gets, I'm just gonna take the minute to say this, the city gets charged uh, up against our bank when those transactions occur. So often we get requested to waive fees for one reason or another. And basically we're, we're, we can't, it's, that is, we actually are passing through the actual charge from our bank that we incurred from that transaction not being able to complete. So I'll just take a minute to educate on that front because that question comes up a lot in our department when they come up, um, which thankfully isn't too often. So walking down, I am gonna share just an additional little highlight with adding um, additional uh, passport staff. Our passport revenue is projecting to go up um, as was presented and I'm sure that the Municipal Services Department will go into that next week during their discussion. And then um, again that pretty much is the highlights of the charges for goods and services. Okay, um, so have we considered the fact that you're now going to be able to renew your passport online? There's like a new. Uh, yeah. Um, renewals, we collect nothing on renewals. So the way you oh, can renew okay. it online. It, okay. It so that's one that won't affect us. us. Okay. Yeah. Very we good. We only collect on new passports. Yeah. And that has stayed pretty stable. In, in other words, it's it hasn't been dropping off or anything. So Not since I've added. Uh, extra passport agent. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Council member Thanks. Uh, the police overtime is that when the police are working overtime in the city, or is that let's say they oh. moonlight at the Husky game this weekend? This is revenue. Yeah. This is revenue. So, yes, that is it's the second, it's the latter. So, it's money coming in from our outside reimbursement. So, and that's UW games. It's not just UW. It's when we go and we help out. Uh, I think it's the city of Snoqualmie that does a huge golf event for Boeing or somebody. Maybe it's not Boeing. Somebody. And so like when our police go and continue to support um, outside agencies or mainly UW, um, that's what we get reimbursed for. And it's a true pass through. <laughs> we good? Next page. So, uh, walking into fines and penalties, um, this category pretty much speaks for itself. It is the the fines and penalties. This is the city's portion of what we end up receiving for basically our the city our our main line item is the traffic safety camera fines from red light and school zone. Um, and then it just is basically, this is a lot of our um, traffic fines, infractions, penalties, um, and whatnot. Before you go on, um, on the traffic infractions, penalties, and uh, camera fines, the uh, $4.4 .4 million that you're projected here. Yeah. Yep. That doesn't represent all of the uh, revenue associated with cameras because some of the camera revenue is so is restricted. We will walk into that and just if just, you if, yeah. if you just give me a, if once we get through the general fund, the actual the what I will call the true general fund, uh, we're going to walk into exactly that and show it's in a, it's going to be in a separate fund. So to clarify, then the traffic infraction penalties, those are uh, by our officers, is that correct? Yes. As opposed to those by yes. the traffic cam? Yes, correct. Okay, so, so that's the officer so, initiated. And, and I also want to clarify exactly what Budget Chair Lebo was saying, is that our traffic safety cameras, prior to anything happening as, as of like the first of this year, this is 
This is what was in place prior to that. And this is just that bucket of revenue as far as back to the traffic, um, the red light, excuse me, and the school zones that were already in place. So this is just that trajectory and that revenue. We will, there is a full separate fund that is a sub fund of the general fund that is going to show all of that revenue and expenditures in its own area because it is restricted, highly restricted. And we wanna make sure that that stays and is only used for its appropriate um, uses per state statute and council intent. So just, to, so the action that we took this summer and the revenue associated with that is separate. And I don't, we, we can wait. We yeah we can wait or we can just we can wait, we can wait. okay. Are there any other? We will have all the little gummies and the and the uh, M and M's. We'll wait. We'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. We'll, we'll all wait. Okay, so we will zip. We will zip right on through to the miscellaneous revenue. Uh, which is the last category of the, the true general fund is what I guess I'll call it from this point. Um, I do want to highlight that interest, uh, investment interest, and I just thought this was something fun for me to go back and look. Do you, I, this actually surprised me. So I, I did go back and look. And in 2021, the city brought in under $6,500 in investment interest in one year in 2021. And then it started to grow significantly in 2022. So I just wanna point that out, um, that that number is drastically changing to a number we actually wanna talk about at this point. Um, and due to some things that are were in our control and some things that were not within the city's control, giving full disclosure there but just an interesting little fun fact for the day. Um, so then walking down and going through, again, the, the Turner Lakefront rent, you're gonna see that was um, a small portion of time. Um, and so that um, the individual that was renting to, to make sure that there was a presence on that property is no longer on that property. And so uh, back to the, leasehold excise tax in addition to the rent that is no longer going to to show through um donations that was a one time for the public safety so, so what tends to happen sometimes and so <laughs> that is actually money that uh, when people sometimes pay cash and they're they they tell you to quote unquote, keep the change, a city cannot do that. And so sometimes they elect to donate. And so the keep the change donations um, have added up to $7 in the last biennium. So that's, it's, and so sometimes that is what will happen. The public safety donations, on the other hand, that was the foundation, if you remember, assisting on outfitting our two new Tahoes. So uh, that is very different, different boat. Uh, city forestry account, those are city fines actually, tend to be kind of fines, penalties-ish. Um, and they tend to get lumped in to directly, we talk about the, the tree accounts, the tree accounts, not the tree fund, the tree accounts. And I'm just gonna take a minute to say, this is the revenue source. And then we will talk about that a little bit more in um, planning, um, community development, excuse me, specifically under the planning uh, umbrella. So then again, walking down, um, P card is a purchasing card rebate that the city receives. Um, and the state opioid settlement, this one is a little wonky to, to try to estimate because um, as the funds have been coming in, some who, some of those that, uh, that are paying the settlements have paid up front 
And some of them are going to be paying over a long period of time, like I think it's 17 years and they're all just a, a bit varying. So that's just one we're, we're estimating and then we'll keep our eye on. Um, the police miscellaneous revenue, actually that is more was intended for the overtime. So that's, we're gonna leave that one alone. And then it's going into the overtime and that's pretty much, and then the transfer from the ARPA fund. And so, um, and then insurance recoveries at capital assets, that's when we have insurance recoveries are like when a vehicle gets hit and then the insurance pays you to fix your vehicle. So then walking, I'm, I'm just going to go right into it because this is where you get to grab some of the candy and talk about what we really are looking for. So next, we just scroll down. So I just highlighted this general fund, non-major, quote, what we call sub funds. So these technically are all what we would define as they have their own bucket. Um, but they do tend to, they are on our fund structure. We have the squares of the major fund and then we have the circles of the sub funds. This, these are circle funds. These are sub funds. So then this is the traffic safety fund. And actually right now we're putting together um, a budget amendment for 2024 that currently um, a, proposes, we're gonna create an ordinance to create this fund um, and it's it's an 002 fund, so it's a sub fund of the general fund, and that this is where the new traffic safety camera fines are going to go. So there's going to be revenue into this fund, and it's going to be an interest bearing fund, and then it will have revenue and expenditures just all within that sub fund. So anything that increases due to those additional cameras that came online um, will be expended out of this fund. And that is because it's restricted towards the use, and so we want to control how much we're getting and we're spending it on the appropriate. And that the balances funds. stay exactly where they're intended to stay until they are until the intention of the use or the um, council direction um, and approval is to send it to the transportation capital to assist in the climate, or excuse me, not climate, uh, I did not mean to say that, traffic calming, um, safe streets, early action, traffic calming, or projects that is decided on from the council. Does that include the interest? Is the interest made on the fines only able to be used in that same fund? It, it will be the cash balance. It won't actually, it, the interest won't come from the, the traffic safety fines. It'll come from the fact that that fund has a cash balance. Mm -hmm. And then we allocate the interest that we receive, whether it's from our banks um, or the uh, governmental agency bonds that the city also has. And we base it off of and divide it out based on the cash balance. So it will receive its appropriate um no, keep going. amount due to the the balance that stays within that account if it, if like the general fund is going to appreciate more interest than like the street fund because it's going to carry a higher balance on a regular basis so it's basically we're fairly allocating our our sum of interest appropriately to where where the the higher and lower balances are going so that interest that you accrue, is it restricted? That is a great question. And actually, we <laughs> right before we created this, that's a great question. I might have to circle back on that. Uh, my accounting supervisor and I actually were looking into that because you you are onto something there. And that question's been asked. We just don't have the answer yet. I hope. We just need to know if it's Absolutely. Right. Yes. Exactly. Okay. It basically means, does this bucket of money follow the exact same restrictions as the other line, or is there variance? Right. That's probably the best way to say it. 
Is that okay? So council contingency fund, um, that's just a fund that continues to just uh, generate interest because of the, the balance that's in there. Same with the budget stabilization fund, strategic opportunity fund. Um, again, that's just uh, that's just going to be an interest. And that is a sub fund of the general fund. And then we have some, I think it's the parks master plan is in that fund on the expenditure side. Um, and so there are some other things that are associated with that. That fund currently is being funded from 301, which is a capital, the capital improvement fund, which is funded, we'll get into that. It's funded um, mainly by REIT. Real estate excise tax, one. Um, try not to abbreviate. So what, oh. Yeah, on the, on the strategic opportunity fund. So I think when I first started on council, we had kind of what I call uncommitted cash in the strategic opportunity fund. And now it is pretty much committed. Is that correct? For the um, most part. Um, that, that, uh, Uh, the, the fund was created, let me be careful how I say it, uh, think about how to say this. So the fund was created, the budget prior to me coming in as a finance director, and the funds that went into generating the revenue within that fund, um, half of that money came from the general fund, right. and half of it actually came from the transportation 302. Uh -huh. 302, re 2 is very restricted. Um, and so those funds just went into to transfer into the fund. Um, and then once the city found a use for those dollars being the lakefront park, we actually had to reallocate that right. because REIT 2 could not purchase, could not pay to purchase to do any form of a land acquisition um, for a park. So that's my caution in putting money into a bucket of, that we don't know exactly how we're going to spend it um, because that ended up being a little trickier than I think was originally anticipated with money going into an area to kind of pull it. So is investment interest uh, that is general fund uh, money going into the strategic opportunity fund or is that also earmarked for something specific? Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to say, is there is there a cash that we can use if something came up in here, or is pretty much everything committed? It is. It's only five hundred fifty four thousand at this point projected yeah. for the future budget. So uh, that what I'm hearing is the five hundred fifty four thousand. We're calling it strategic opportunity fund, but the opportunity is what that money's intended for. It, there is a, like we once had some general fund money sitting there that we could call on. Am I correct? Yes. So I just, I just had to revisit the capital, the schedule. Basically I went to, I'm on page 107 to look at the schedule of capital improvement projects and the two things. So even though they say the strategic opportunities fund, it, it looks like there's, um, $530,000 allocated out of it right now. So 30,000 towards, um, 30,000 towards the pros to update the master, the parks master plan and the lakefront park development design is 500,000. And those are transferred from 301. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to flag that therefore there isn't like cash sitting there available for some other strategic opportunity that comes our way. And before we did the Lakefront Park purchase, we did have that. So just flagging that distinction. We, we put that money in at the time because we were at the point where council was keep having opportunities come their way and no way to pay for right. it. And so the yeah. idea at the time was the budget for right. the chair. It's like, let's create a little fund right. and get some money there just in case. Right, so. right. I like I still like the concept of just in case money, so long as it's not too much <laughs> sitting there doing nothing, you know. In, in this example, though, um, based upon what's projected, 
there is no real money sitting no. there. Right. It's like twenty thousand dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Right. Because we're spending all the stuff we have twenty twenty three twenty four is it allocated as well? So we're just continuously preserving that money for something. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe so many opportunities. So the point is, if we want to put something in there, we need to do it on top of what's already there. right. Correct. That that's uh, part of what I was not so artfully getting at. Thank you. Um, the other um, uh, way to maybe to possibly just a thought to go about that is to earmark um, it as a proviso that if if additional funds are available that we replenish the earmark some yeah yeah another thought to just put in intention like they first off the target. So then we're going to walk to the street fund. Um, and the street fund, ROW is right-of-way permits for construction, right-of-way for utility franchise. Um, and those those agreements came to council a couple years ago, I think. Um, and then the gas tax, the motor vehicle excise tax, Definitely one to, to keep an eye on there because as of right now, that is continually not, it is trending down, not by a huge dollar amount, um, but one that definitely is since um, the pandemic, I've been, we've been keeping an eye on. And I will say that the trend is not increasing on that. Um, and I think with more, electric vehicles, it's just an area that we're definitely going to want to watch. Um, oh. does, does anyone know the policy implication? I thought the state legislature was talking about something because of declining gas tax revenues. They were talking about some kind of charge for electric vehicles, an additional charge. Um, I assume that nothing has passed. Um, so, but it would be good to keep an eye on if it is going to pass to make sure there's a pass through uh, to the jurisdictions that used to get revenues from the gas tax and the state doesn't hawk at all. <laughs> yeah. If I may, uh, just on point, we continue with our conversations with uh, with our friends in Olympia, share revenue, share revenue, share revenue. Uh -huh. That's a definitely a component of it. Yeah. It's not, yes, you, you, uh, you provided us a share of part of the revenue from the coal sales back in 1890 and right. now it's gone. So, you know, we need something, we need something substantial depending on how things change. Okay. Thank you. Because it's road usage and so forth. Yeah. And the transfer from the general fund, is that for a specific purpose or yes. just to fill it out for the CID projects that are no. needing it? But uh, no, because the street fund doesn't really, that doesn't, that isn't a project fund, that's an operations fund. Ah. So it's it's maintenance and operations. You have the street maintenance versus the street operations. Um, the transfer is for the street lights. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's a direct transfer of the expense. And then walking down to the Transportation Benefit District Fund, there's two sources um, that go into this. We basically have the, the um, vehicle tabs that were just in 23 and 24. We, the city um, increased those an additional $10 and then elected to do the sales tax. Um, and so those numbers are coming in. Just remember that the projected numbers in 23-24 um, are not going to be the full two-year numbers because when we adopted that change, I believe it was the vehicle tab fees that we couldn't, that we started receiving those, I believe it was mid to late April. And then it wasn't until June that we were able to, I think it was six months worth of the sales tax before it actually was able to show up. So just just a note that those 
that projected for 23, 24 isn't a true. So we'll be watching that for 25, 26 to see that as a true two year change. I just wanted to add a note that when we brought forward the loan, the public works for yes. loan, that this is the fund and those new funds are what will pay the debt service on that $2 million loan. So, well, we have more money. We committed it back then. There are some options potentially with the new traffic camera fines. And you could you could pay for it with those and keep the TBD money where it is. It's it's six happens goes to the other, but at this point in time that's committed to that that debt service. Okay. So walking to the capital improvement fund, um, the, the city has been seeing a decline in the real estate excise tax. So um, we're very cautiously estimating those revenues for the next uh, biennium. The recreation um, RCO state grant um, that is, that is uh, associated to the the demo of what was just approved, correct? Yes, not correct. It was associated with the with the uh, the demo, and so we're going to start doing the actual work over on the lakefront property. And you can tie that out. You can look to see that the lakefront demo on the capital improvement side um, is is going to start showing up in that fund um, because it it really is inappropriate for it to show up to start having the work that's gonna occur over on that lakefront property in the strategic opportunity fund. It's more appropriate to show it in a capital improvement fund. So there's a, I, and I'm just trying to very transparently say this because there's gonna be a little bit of a transition of, it has been within 106 and now it's gonna move to 301, but there there is a reason not to be confusing. <laughs> it's not my goal just to be accurately showing where it should be. And oh. then oh, I'll, I'll wait till you finish this and then going down to the King County Parks levy, um, just stating that this is where, this is the fund of which the city receives and then interest. That's my yeah, um, if REIT is decreasing, is that a sign that even as home prices keep going up, fewer people are selling their homes possibly because they're afraid to sell for fear of not being able to afford it in the house. I think the reasons are, um, or, I, maybe, I'm not, I'm not maybe, I don't, maybe, let me ask that without editorializing. Is this a sign <laughs> that even as home prices are increasing, fewer people are selling? Yes. Okay. Selling, purchasing, also, on top of it has been high interest rates are really bad. You know, the Fed just got it by a half percent, so they're starting dragging down um, loan rates, and they're expecting another half percent decrease next year, 2025. So it's something we'll watch because you may see people either willing to sell it and move up, so you not pay seven percent interest. But it's calculated based on the total sale. So whether or not you sell one really expensive property or you sell 10 less correct. expensive properties, the total it's just a dollar it's a percentage it's of a, the total sale. Correct, it's a percentage. And so, I mean, it, if some larger properties sold, it, it could easily show a, diff a very different trend um, versus a a higher quantity of small of lower dollar so it's it's just it's one that um in the 23 24 biennium it started to trend down so we're just being a little bit more on the cautious side on that front question question i looked into answer to but more just i need as we move into middle housing and we're doing more of, let's say rentals is there a rental income piece that comes to this city it's only with sales yeah okay it's just sales so then walking down to the 
Oh, did well, you have a question? Well, I just uh, to continue that thought, if people that were renting properties had to get a business license in Lake Forest Park, that might be. Yeah, if if you're doing any form of um yeah, business in Lake Forest Park. Also jumping off that, if we have more people building ADUs or duplexes, criminal housing, would that lead to a corresponding increase? I suppose the construction permits and then potentially down the line reach if they sell one part of that. Um any form of sale, any form of sale hits the number uh, that the city receives revenue from. Yeah, one of the things that uh, other jurisdictions look at is the impact of Airbnb rentals on the um, price of rents within the city. And we're a small city, but we have a surprising number of Airbnb rentals. And so, you know, I don't think it's an urgent priority, but at some point we should uh, look at that and whether we want to require uh, along the lines of what Council Member Good said, um, some kind of registration process. Right now we're, we're uh, it's kind of, you know, laissez-faire. And um, other cities I think have taken uh, different approaches. And it, it is, it does tend to be inflationary uh, because it takes, uh, you know, full-time rental property off the market. Um, so just um, some thought, like I think Palm Springs, California, uh, recently just capped the number of Airbnbs that you can have for, you know, those kind of rentals. Uh, and other jurisdictions are looking at that as well. So just um, parking that thought for the for the future. Not uh, We have so much going on with the comp plan and the middle uh, housing regulations and stuff. I think that that's you know something to be taken up once we've cleared the decks. But I do think we should think about that. Uh, and uh, I have not no checked in to see what the trend is. Like, are there even more Airbnb rentals than there used to be, or has it stayed pretty flat? Uh, business licenses are required for either. Should I mean in Seattle, it's required because yeah. you're because of the way they get reported on that person's. You know, it gets reported as income. So they're so having a business license seems like a, a logical next step. And what I would see is at first we would just kind of keep track of it, see what the situation is like. So the licenses would give us some handle on that or registration and paying a registration thing. So it's part of that thought. So what's my little um and the other thing that we've sort of touched on the subject in years past is if this creates some sort of development uh, interest that we might consider impact use or other ways of addressing the additional growth that would provide us specific revenue to, to put towards improvements that are needed yeah. to our infrastructure for these uh, newer construction projects with the more density. I would simply agree that other other juris, bigger jurisdictions do have those routinely, and so at some point, again, it depends on whether we think the cost benefits there for us. It has to be an impact for us to charge a fee. So, well, and, and the impact fees can only take from new infrastructure right. that is caused by right. the new development. And there's also instead of doing impact fees, you just through a developer's agreement to get the same thing out of that. And so, yeah, that's, that's we've yeah. kind of toyed with impact these over the years, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense. We don't we don't own the water, so there's not that. I think the water system would put in an impact fee if they desired. Um, for us, I think it could be a sewer impact fee, a park fee, um, but you have to go through a pretty extensive study to set those fees that they are. Okay, thank you. So then walking down to the transportation capital fund, um, this is real estate excise tax two. Uh, um, anywhere that you see RAB is roundabout. I'm just going to say that. So we've got the, the WASDOT roundabout. We've got the state transportation improvement board um, that 
is that's the roundabout. Um, we have uh, Department of Commerce uh, that was a grant that was received this year. Um, Lake Forest Park Water District, their uh, tie in to the roundabout. Um, the Interfund uh, surface, we're not anticipating that happening. Uh, moving forward, the interest investment, um, it, um, that is, again, we're we're estimating that cautiously. Um, the General Works GEO loan, um, that stands for General Obligation Loan. Um, that's the type of debt. If you do it for like sewer or surface water, it's called revenue debt. Um, but for transportation, it's called General Obligation. Um, and that is tied to the roundabout. Again, once we have a little bit more information on that, um, there might be a little bit more of uh, juggling around of those funds so that they're properly receded, received and debt paid back. That being stated, we wanted to show within the mayor's proposed that the intention is for that, that 2 million will go into the fund that is actually paying for the expense of the actual project. Um, so transfer in from uh, the general fund and then uh, transfer in from traffic safety fund. So I wanna highlight that because that's, um, that is the new fund. The traffic safety fund is 002. So um, in the mayor's proposed budget, the intention is to transfer some additional funds um, if they are receded in at a certain dollar amount uh, this year and in the future um, to continue to support capital projects. So I just wanna highlight that. And then traffic uh, transfer from TBD, um, that's for the overlay ADA, that's what we've always done 800,000. That's just a consistent carry forward. Um, are there any questions? Okay, so then we're gonna keep walking. Uh, uh, capital facilities maintenance. Again, this fund is basically funded from uh, 301, which is REIT 1. So I'm trying to tie this uh, all back together. So again, um, from the transportation capital fund, that's from, from 301. Uh, and this fund, we've been we've been sending some money there, so it's carrying a little bit of a balance. So uh, some of that fund balance can pay for some of the projects that are anticipated to be built into it in this 25-26 budget. So then, if we just go ahead and walk down, and now let's get into the sewer and sewer capital. So again, I am showing this a little differently than we have in the past. So sewer, the sewer utility fund, the sewer capital fund, the bond reserve fund, and the public works trust fund repayment fund. All of these funds roll or are sub funds, are circle funds that go into the one main fund. So I'm showing them all together to, to help create that, that picture a little bit more vividly. So the sewer utility fund, um, the, the main highlights in this is that the city is anticipating, as uh, the city administrator already presented, to increase the city's rate, portion of the sewer rate, uh, 5%, both in 2025 and 2026, to continue to keep up with operations. King County's rate is increasing 5.75 in 2025 and is anticipated to increase at a rate of 7% in 26. Um, this behind the scenes, we have a rate calculator that we have created in order to do um, to, to come up with these numbers of what that will look like. And that is what we've used in order to generate these numbers. Now with some of that, that uh, sewer service, uh, the utility tax, those numbers are again, are gonna be revenue expenditures that are gonna walk into revenue in the general fund. Can you go back just a moment? Yes. So the 5% that we're increasing proposed, 25, 26, that's to represent an increase necessary for our expenses. The King County charges are on top of that. 
So and the, they're a pass through. The, so the the way that the rate is set up for the sewer that uh, has always been set up, and um, and we can display this. Uh, I can send out a, a sheet to explain this a little bit more clearly. There's a portion of the city's rate that we define as a, as King County's, and then we we have our a portion of the rate that is defined as the city's. And so we're saying the smaller, much smaller city's portion, we want to increase that portion, not in not the rate in totality. So the rate in totality would be, um, I don't have that percentage, but it's not combined. I'm not, we are not asking to increase the 5.75 and then 5% on that total rate. There's two separate blocks of the rate that equal the total amount. I'm smiling because my recollection is that when we've done those increases, you have that table to show yes. that you're only increasing this portion yes. of that total of this amount, yes. not of the total. Correct. And so that will be... Your memory is serving you well. Yeah. It'll be nice to see that sooner than later. Got it. Absolutely. So I just want to... Um, we can absolutely share that out, and um, but uh, and um, that's how we've come to the numbers within this. Um, so those kinds of things are good reminders, and there are other little things sprinkled through here that are reflected with that. And having that mm -hmm. would be nice because when we talk about a five percent increase, well, it's a five percent increase on what exactly. Uh, um, related to that, if you're going to be putting out educational material for, material for the public, you might also want to include the King County Sewage Capacity Surcharge, because it gets confusing when there's a county sewage surcharge, and then there's a county increase on the city sewage bill, and there's a city increase on the city sewage bill, and for the public, it all starts to blur together. Um, we will make sure, actually, um, I don't know that we can... We will, I will make sure, let me just rephrase that. I will make sure that this actually ties in when public works goes for the department presentation next week. So that will be on next Thursday. I'll make sure that he adds these tables into his discussion. And if he wants me to, to speak on them, I will. Um, does that, that sooner than later, uh, the that, sooner? That works. <laughs> um, and then, so then when we talk about, so it says excise tax revenue going down to the public works uh, trust fund repayment, the city has a portion of, and I, I, I don't know the exact number of um, off the top of my head, um, of accounts that still have our, our grandfathered in on the septic. So they still pay the city's portion. They don't pay the King County treatment portion because they aren't sending it to King County for sewage treatment. So that being said, they still are paying the city's portion in order to, to generate that. It's just going into a different fund. Um, and then, so the utility tax, the late fees, again, that's not something that we want to essentially see as an increased revenue. We just, we would just appreciate that people pay their bills on time. Um, and then the interest, we're just cautiously doing that. Um, and then pretty much in the capital sewer fund, this is where interest and then the utility, the sewer utility rate also assists in continuing to fund the, the sewer capital fund. So that's an ongoing. Uh, the sewer bond reserve, again, that's just an interest bearing and, and a bucket of money that's that just accrues interest. And again, the public works trust fund. Um, and that's where we pay our, our revenue debt out of. Are there any questions there? So then a very similar conversation walking into surface water. Um, this is service water for the city of Lake Forest Park is receded in through King County is the property tax. That's how it's receded in. Um, what's newly being proposed in this 25-26 budget is this is not a definitely not a new discussion. 
the surface water utility fund has been falling behind and the capital side of the fund, um, that fund, because the city has been completing projects, it was already a little bit on the lower side because of completing project culvert projects like L60. Um, and so what has happened with that is it's it's because of a good reason. We are we were using the fund in its exact intention, which was to complete capital projects. But the cause and effect is that now the fund balance has has been drawn down, and then with some unforeseen projects such as 28th, 35th, um, that continue to ask it to spend some money, um, it continues to run into some a little bit of more of a strain. So what the city is proposing in 25 and 26 is 10% of a rate increase each year in order to try to bridge that operational gap. In addition, with all of the NPDES, which is the National Pollution Pollutants Discharge, Discharge Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, we should, yes, by the end of this, we will be experts on saying that. Um, and so, and then the other 10% is tied directly to increasing, um, basically hiring a new position in order to manage just our, that would be fully funded through the surface water fund to manage that permitting um, program that is costing uh, so much from the Department of Ecology, this program, um, and basically having personnel to manage it all, which is a very heavy lift. Um, and I'm gonna stop right there because I, are there any questions on that proposal? Yeah, all I wanted to do was remind um, ourselves of the fact that we had this discussion that this is a heavy unfunded mandate with yes. very little uh, funds coming our way. And it's it's primarily federal, but because the federal and the state programs are, the federal programs delegated to the state basically, and they have to comply with the federal requirements. It's just uh, for a city like ours, so burdensome. To me, this is one of my, you know, fundamental concerns about charge about costs that we're experiencing that uh, have come at us without any um, uh, assistance uh, from the federal or state level, or not enough assistance from the federal or state level. So I think we have no choice but to try to cover our costs other ways. So it's unfortunate though, I feel like, you know, there could be, there's a there's a lot of bureaucracy associated with this. I, I will just say, uh, just a couple years ago, um, our previous senior project manager, Andy, kept coming, bringing forward contracts, uh, saying the demand on this surface water fund. And he kept telling us, you know, as we become more and more compliant, it really has a high cost. And boy, was he not kidding. <laughs> it really does have a high cost. And so now we're starting from those conversations a couple of years ago, we're starting to actually see the numbers of that actual cost. Yeah, I was hoping that we would have far fewer properties in that stormwater registry, but it seemed like we ended up with a lot in there. And then that has the whole enforcement monitoring burden associated with it. So. Anyway, just a little venting or angst about this. Question. Yes. Um, is the feeling from Public Works that the NPDES will require a full FTE, or might this hire be available? Like they'd spend most of their time on that, yeah. but they'd also be able to help share some of the workload since we are a small city. Well, we asked lots so, of questions. Yeah, we asked lots. <laughs> so when Jeff brought this to me, I was skeptical. So I requested a meeting with our consultant and we currently pay over $200,000 a year and it's going to go up another 55,000 with the new regulations um, coming at us. But uh, my question to them was, is this a full-time job? You know, we, we heard from our previous project manager, part of the reason he left was 
that's a full-time job plus all the other stuff that he was doing. And they said, it's absolutely a full-time job for the size of city. There's not a lot of difference between all of the work that has to be done for compliance and then all, all the paperwork, regardless of the size of city, as he explained it to us. And um, so my next question was, if we hire somebody, how much of your contract would we be able to write down and have you do less? And the recommendation in the mayor's budget is for a senior level type of position to be able to take a lot of that workload. There's going to be a lot of the, you know, the pumping and the clean out and some of the inspections that they're not going to have time for, but try and it's going to be a cost plus no matter what we do, but to try and alleviate some of that cost in the contract that we currently have with Comsor to do some of that work. Um, he said if you brought brought somebody in who was green, you, you, you'd have them plus Comsor. So the idea is to, to hire somebody that's got the expertise to not be a full cost. So maybe not realize full cost of that person because we alleviate some of the contract we have. But yes, it's a full-time position. Okay, so and we are the only one in the region other than Briar that doesn't have this position in the city. Okay, so while this position wouldn't help to alleviate current public work stress, it would help to reduce how much we're spending on outside contractors. Yeah, and take it off of the senior project manager who would never fill that position. So what if it possible? Could you just sort of, in a paragraph or a little chart, outline what this means? In the sense that, you know, if we're paying a consort um, $250,000, does that go down by $50,000? And if we are spending a full time FTE right now and we hire this position, does that free up any availability elsewhere? I mean, it's sort of like, can you sort of describe the justification of it other than just as a request? Yeah, it'd, it'd be hard to put a dollar amount to how much we could drive down the consort contract because they said without knowing who you end up being able to hire. That's going to be dependent on their expertise, but I, I could reach out to them and say, if we bought, if we got, if we bought, basically, if we bought somebody <laughs> who was, you know, a, a senior level engineer and had them in, what workload do you think you would still have on your books? But it's sort of like a justification. Mm -hmm. no. I, why do you, why do you need this position? I need this position because over the last two years we've been required to do X. Yeah, and that reflects. Uh, 0.8 FTE in addition to what was already being reported. Yeah, gotcha. And if we don't do this, then we run the risk of not being able to do other things because we still have to be in compliance. Yeah. And, and what would those other things be that we wouldn't be doing? Gotcha. And I think Jeff did yeah. some amount of that work and is enhancing the request. That's not and everybody. I was going to say maybe we just need to in. Uh, basically send out an additional the enhancement request on that. Yeah, let me read through it and see, see if there's other answers we need based on what I'm hearing. Because as a general fund, we're driven by labor, personnel costs. Mm -hmm. And so every time we increase personnel, we want to be able to say, we understand why we're doing that. We're just not growing the number of persons in the city because when our constituents look at us and say, well, why are you getting bigger? The city still is the same size as it was two years ago. So why is city staff broke? Yeah. Yeah. Council member broke and then the council member broke. So as someone who in my youth worked on the National Food Discharge Elimination System, also known as the Clean Water Act, um, there's often a certain amount of interpretation involved in how far you have to do things. It's usually, you know, things aren't usually that rigid. And as we bring on a new stormwater person, I would like to, this is not a revenue issue. Well, it is a revenue issue, ultimately. I'd like to have that person look at our inventory that we previously prepared, because uh, my impression was the initial sense we had of the inventory of what we have to monitor and enforce on and inspect every X number of years was gonna be shorter and then it ended up being a whole lot longer. So I, I just like to, you know, do, you know, get a second opinion on that because that would drive the future costs, uh, right? The magnitude mm -hmm. of what we have right now. So if there's even an opportunity to 
comply, but comply while looking at things conservatively. Uh, I'd like us to take a look at that. So I think we all would like to see that. I, I just remember being kind of shocked when we saw the, the final list. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that would help us on the rent, on the uh, cost side for, for the future. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily reduce the need for a full-time person, but uh, especially if you get someone with expertise, it would be nice to have them take a look at the list and see if they want to correct it. So, to your comment, Chair, um, I was thinking that, yes, we go back to our constituents and say, yep, another unfunded federal mandate. I was just at a Riot 8 meeting where uh, this um, topic, very topic, was brought up. And apparently they're changing the system so there's a certain amount of points you have to earn through basically doing different kinds of projects, including stormwater retention, stormwater treatment. And problem I saw with our city is that uh, the new the new construction new uh, projects get more points than just simply maintaining or you know uh, operating your your system, so that's going to become an issue. And I think having this person might be very helpful because as Councilmember Bodie said, there's a certain amount of wiggle room probably in these point regulation kind of things. And us getting to that because they keep raising the number of points every year you need to actually comply with the permit. It, it, it's going to be tricky, so having that expertise would be valuable. It's my understanding that those new requirements are what are driving the additional fifty-five thousand dollars a year. Yeah, contract. Thank you. So um, then, walking into the final, this is uh, this is how the city funds our um, vehicle and equipment. Um, Repair and Replacement Fund and the Information Technology Equipment Fund that was newly created. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and say that there's just going to be more discussion to come on that. <laughs> because vehicles is, uh, is definitely an issue um, at the city. And I'm just going to reserve that expense discussion not under this umbrella. Um, just know that we we definitely have a plan going forward and one that is to be discussed with council um, in order to figure out how to solve some of our, our vehicle uh, and equipment challenges moving forward. Do you believe at that? Yeah, September and, 30th. Bring a proposal on how we get out of this hole of having old cars with high mileage. Um, just a quick update, WCA has now told us that any vehicle over 10, year, 10 years of age or older um, will no longer be eligible for um, replacement for a new vehicle. So right now, if we have an 11-year-old vehicle and it's, it's totaled, we get full replacement value for light vehicle. Um, it's going to be based off of the cash value depreciated minus your deductible now if it's 10 years or older. Um, they're just they're losing their shirts on we're all keeping old vehicles and then they're getting they're, they're not worth much they get totaled down they have to give us you know fifty thousand dollars to buy a new light vehicle so they're changing that coverage so, so does that mean that you'll have to replace your vehicles when they become 10 years nine years and nine months <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for PD, we probably should replace several of these already in 120,000 miles of idling and, and things. You know, we, we have problems. Uh, yeah, it, it it's, it's not reflective of reality. I think I have a 10 year old vehicle with 140,000 miles on it. It's going great, but um, they don't want to replace it for a new vehicle. I'm going to total it. So we just went out. It's against environment to that saying that we need to throw away a perfectly good vehicle and get a new one for financial reasons is not environmentally sound. Yeah. yeah we could discuss this for hours about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> disposable economies. Throw it away because it got old. Anyway, but we do. It, there's other th factors that drive it that increase maintenance costs and things like that. What we're saying is. Great. And 
And then I'm just gonna take the moment to uh, say that uh, not shocking that uh, technology is becoming more and more expensive. Um, information technology, uh, the to replace the the hardware um, and to keep going on software and whatnot, it, it's just the cost is is increasing. And so I just am sharing that. Um, and I, this year, uh, Aaron, uh, our information systems manager is going to come and actually do our department presentation with me, um, on Monday. And so you're going to get to hear directly from him, uh, for his items. So more to come on that. Sounds like my favorite. Um, if there's a way, I, I don't know if you should be talking about like the security and like what happened at CTAC and like oh. how are we? No, he's not going to be not talking going about to... uh, we that uh, so how, how we're preparing for it. Like, are we from we don't know? Oh, well, like, yeah, how we, we know we, we just he, don't discuss it in the public of what we're doing. Oh, that's yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm but sorry, I said, I guess I should have probably finished my when I was like absolutely not <laughs> I, I probably should have finished the thought of thank you Phil uh, we can we're, have an executive session yes. and we can come talk okay, to you yeah, specifically yeah. about what's yeah. being done I we, we were not even allowed to speak one word about it during any audit process that's kind of yes yeah. so yeah yes. I don't want to I don't want to preach any laws or anything but um I, I am bring it up. personally curious if we have an executive session on yes. that yeah. Yeah. We, we absolutely can. Sorry, the way that came, that just like no, sorry. <laughs> clearly, it's the end of a, a long day. Um, because that that isn't yes. Thank you, thank, thank you. you for for finishing that. And I I think that's yeah. that's it. It's a little past six forty five. I know it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that brings us to the end of the mayor's revenue projections. Are there any other questions? Um, and Jim, did a general question. Yes. Where are you most worried about Random missing movies. targets, or or what's the most you know concerning, unknowable, or uh, or concerning from a revenue standpoint? Surface water. Okay. I, I'm sur the surface water, that operational fund, and the actual capital fund. Um. To me, uh, we the the general fund has its challenges currently, um, with a proposed uh, you know we're, we're bringing you a, a budget that is proposing to use some unallocated fund balance. That being stated, the fund that definitely has me uh, most concerned, I will one hundred percent stand by what I said. I've been saying for a couple months now is the surface water fund. And I, it is a little bit, um, we've had a long conversations about what level of money we should be asking for uh, in order to, and I, I just want to be really clear that even though we're asking for 20% of an increase, 10% is just to try to keep the wheels on the bus um, on all these additional unfunded mandates and, um, Aging infrastructure. Aging infrastructure, increasing costs of, of just everything, inflation from supplies, professional services, um, you know, staff, staffing costs, healthcare benefits. I mean, it's it's just across the board. Everything's going up and nothing's going the opposite direction. And so it just it all adds up. And um that's probably the the fund that I am the most, and, and when I'm talking about it, and I'd, I'd love to be setting aside and designating to be building back our capital side of that fund. And that isn't really 100% being proposed in this original budget because to ask for 20% for two years in a row, from our standpoint, if you add the, the 10 and the 10, that seems, it's a lot of it's a lot of an ask, but we're asking for very specific reasons. 
Uh, it's an enterprise fund. It has to stand on its own two feet. And we're starting to see indicators that it's not. And so um, in order for it to break even, that is the 10% ask. And then um, bringing forward and having the very honest conversation that we do believe that we um, as administration need that additional position at a senior project manager level um, in order to help manage the work uh, that that we need to complete in order to be successful. Um, it's also the fund that supports any future culvert projects. Not 100%, but we've got to have a match. So. I just just quickly, um, we're all trying to think outside. I know we're talking specifically about the biennial budget, but thinking into the future, in the next biennial, we're, we're really going to have to reconsider um, increased capitalization of the SER capital fund. I have concerns about risk there down, way down, way down the line. There's some I'm sorry, which one? Sewer, sewer capital. Sewer, yeah. sewer capital. There's some unknowns there. And uh, aging infrastructure, again, it's part and parcel. Of course, this is nothing to do with the state. It's fascinating to us. But I, that's something to bookmark for the future conversations. Um, Matt, can you bring up um, page 14? And this is just a reminder, and then I'll have to bring up page 21. And this is just to help folks be oriented um, because we do talk about. The general fund is 001 and sewer utility fund is 401. And so we all have a cheat sheet in our manuals to yes. go back to, to remember that we've got our box funds and then we have our circle funds. And then if we draw lines between them, which we won't, only certain <laughs> funds can fund certain funds. Correct. And certain funds are restricted funds. And so, so that gets into the sort of color of money. Yes, 14. And typically, if you have something listed at, under like a, a general fund one zero zero one, that does or does not include the circle funds, like you're just kind of getting a big number. What do you what do you typically so what do you typically do with your budget? We're gonna we're as I was starting unintentionally just started saying tonight uh, this evening to describe it is. I will probably be continuing to say the true general fund. The true general fund is what we're going to define as 001. And, and then when I refer to a sub fund, I will always try to call that out, that it is a sub fund of the general fund. Um, and that being said, I will, I think that will, if that's okay with council, that we will just kind of continue to use that language throughout the whole conversation. So that we don't get confused, especially with a new font. I think I think that's good. The other is as you have been doing is to help remind us that certain funds are restricted. So when yes. you have a revenue or a REIT one or a REIT two, they are restricted in terms of what they can do. So. Should we should we mark restricted? On point, I sent you folks links to the MRSC primer on REIT one, REIT two, as well as the permit. Uh, code, hello, code where we authorize the use of three, three, three two, uh, the collection of that. So, if you want to geek out, it's, it's definitely cool. So, it would be helpful as we walk through to remind us what you're uh, restricted, how they're restricted. And then, um, I think I, I want to try to keep this as simple as possible. Um, <laughs> Because it's restricted, but it's uh, some of these are restricted um, by state statutes versus a resolution versus there's some different parameters. And then some of them are like enterprise funds are little businesses that have to stand on their own two feet. That's a that is a very straightforward way to say it. And so when we talk about, you know, that I'm concerned about the surface water utility fund and the surface water capital fund. I'm concerned about that fund because it doesn't have an option. It through the rates that are paid, it has to pay for all the expenditures that are going out the door. And so it has to stand on its own two feet like a little business between those the the operations and the capital. Um, and so when those funds start to show operationally that they are not, that starts to concern me. And so just um, but again, and then the fiduciary funds, I'm just going to, 
even though they're on our budget and they're on our fund structure and we technically uh, um, take care of them financially and, and act to cut their checks, et cetera, I just want to point out we don't make decisions 100% um, as far as the you know the city of Lake Forest Park we are we are partners within these but we are not sole decision makers um they have separate i think boards boards for the yeah, for Namco and there's a voting percentage Lake Forest Park and uh, Kenmore in the new ILA that we'll be bringing for 2025 that we will share and then um, the fire district has a small share which will be a tiebreaker or the other is it fair to say that we sort of act as an administrative uh, support for these yes. and so our responsibility when you call it fiduciary is that we act as an administrator perform certain functions for which we may not necessarily have decision making power correct but we simply provide support which cities do to each other correct for, for each other so we not to sometimes too but sometimes. <laughs> yes and so that uh that can get complex to explain and in fact uh through our last audit actually we had to go over that well you see this um with race it. Kirkland is the fiduciary for that. They handle all of that. We all pay them to them, so. And they don't have, they, they have a large vote, but they could be outvoted by them. That's. Council member. Exactly what you said. So even though, yeah, I just want to point that out that they're on here and because we do carry it. Um, that being said, we, we, that's a piece of what we don't drive 100% of the decision on. It's the good neighbor thing. Yep. Yes. Did you get your question? And if you, um, if we want to go through and um, to walk through what is restricted and how we can, we can do that. Okay. That's good. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And then the next one I wanted to go to is I believe page 20. And that's just to remind us uh, where we are in this process. Mm -hmm. So tonight was to walk through the mayor's proposed revenue. And so our next one is on the 23rd, we will uh, start with the detailed departmental presentations of the mayor's proposed revenue. Correct. And uh, on Monday, you're going to hear from Municipal Services, uh, which is the clerk's Matt's department, the court, um, finance and IT, executive, HR, and police. Yep. We're putting police at the end for because they like to talk. Putting them against a wall. <laughs> so he has to hurry. <laughs> if he wants to. Yeah. Uh, any other questions on this? Or? Oh, good. So that'll bring us down to our next um, new business item, which is the levy concern. And I will just see. Mr. Thank you. And this will be quick. Um, so we have we formed the selection committee with Council Member Riddle, Council Member Goldman, Director Vaughn, and myself. Um, we received three um, proposals for. Uh, consultants to help us with the levy lid lift. Uh, we interviewed two of those. Both of those came with the recommendation that um, we use a polling company rather than do a focus group. They, both of them stress the fact that focus groups are the 12 same people that you always talk to who are polling. You really get a sense for what the community feels. Um, and so we have selected a consultant their dollar amount will drive that we need to come to council to get that contract approved, obviously. Um, their research and strategy firm is within the mayor's signing authority, and we need to get them going now because they need to finish their work by December 8th to turn it over to the consulting group who will work with council on the contract between now and that time so that we have from December until November of next year to go through this process. Um, and so I didn't want to get out ahead of council without you knowing that we, we will be engaging the research and strategy firm 
now to get that data so that as council approves the contract for the uh, or the um, public research public uh, affairs public. public affairs I'm sorry uh, that you know that there's some work going on that's going to feed right into that and kick us off in December to, to get going so um we had set aside about forty thousand dollars in this year's budget uh, as part of the money that we clawed back from uh, the plus structure in the PD. That would more than cover as more money than we need for the Olympic research and strategy. And then the rest of the money has been allocated. Well, it will be allocated <laughs> in the upcoming budget. Um, I had put, and I'll discuss this on Monday night, but about one hundred twenty thousand dollars in. Professional services for 2025 26 to cover that cost. And the, the, the remainder of the funds that we set aside would carry us through December with the public affairs firm. So if you have any questions, otherwise, we will go into detail and have the consultants there when we bring that contract forward. Um, but any questions I can answer today? What, what's the expected revenue from? That's the, that's I mean, just, that's a question for council. That's something that they will explore with. No, no, I, I mean, what is the expected if you do it? The levy, the if you do the levy. Yes. What is the expected? Yeah. That that's that's a decision council has to make. So right currently we have a one point five million dollar in our general fund budget. So we have one point five million less revenues than we have expenditures. So what occurred during the last attempt at this? was council came to a decision on how much money they felt comfortable going out to the public to ask for and what tax rate that drove and how much of an increase per year that was to households. And we looked at 750,000, a million, that maybe a million five for businesses. I can't remember exactly, but that's where we are now. It's not a decision, but of the amount the council would ask the voters for. But you're saying that the whole is one and a half. Million. The whole is right now is one and a half million. So your minimum just to fill the gap is like five million. But what does that look like as far as a rate to the taxpayer? And right. if you want more for capacity to do some things within your general fund, how much do you want to ask the public? Council member. Um, yeah. So one of the things that came up in the interviews, and this is a core subject to discussion of change by the full council, is the focus of the levy would be public safety. Okay. Not will be validated by December through the research firm. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, or they'll come with the community wants something. So we and then we can have a conversation. Yeah. And that that's exactly what we'll do. Let's have that conversation. And so to kick off with the research and strategy group, um, you know, they would put together the questions of my recommendation is that the um, council leadership and mayor be that team. That's what we did last time um, to vet those questions. We can't have a forum vetting questions. Um, and so since that group already meets on a, on a weekly basis, I thought that was a good group to then they could have one-off discussions, but well, as long as we don't end up with a serial meeting, but we need to make sure that we capture the community. I think we saw that with, um, the comp plan update as the consultants brought in the questions that they wanted to, they thought they should ask. And our planning commission was like, whoa, you don't know our community. Here's how we would work this, how we would work that. Then we went through that process. And I think that was a very successful um, outreach effort. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about. And we'll do the same thing with the public affairs firm. We'll go through the same type of thing of messaging and what it is you're being asked for. Is the is the one point five an, an annual? Yes, it's an annual. Yeah, you're three million short in general fund, but we buy in, so it's roughly one point five. That's more then, about in and Yeah, I wanted to say that this is a common interest of other jurisdictions. You know, I'm I'm on Sound City's policy group and Sound City's deputy mayor's group, and uh, definitely we hear about this. Uh, the city of Des Moines. Uh, have tried to do a public safety levy without a lot of this prep work, uh, kind of more similar, I think, to what we did last time on the parks and uh, and sidewalks levy. 
particular lift and uh, they didn't succeed. So they're kind of regrouping and trying to move forward. But even um, the bigger, much more affluent cities than ours are looking at the fact that public safety costs are uh, dramatically higher. And they, they all have, uh, like cities like Kirkland, Sammamish, Issaquah, have substantial revenue gaps that they're trying to fill with a heavy emphasis on, um, on public safety costs and, and, and just salaries and, and supplies and so forth. So uh, just trying to say that other cities will be in the same place as we are uh, doing similar things. So uh, hopefully that will help us get a positive response that, you know, it's a broader regional issue. But uh, I was surprised that Sammamish, Issaquah, and Kirkland, who are on my last uh, deputy mayor call, all were saying they had like 10% budget gaps. We're right about in that same. And some of them are neighbors. Yeah, well, I didn't hear any of those, but 10%, that's a lot for the cities that have so much revenue. Yeah, so, Council Member I was going to say, because I was 1.5 million per year, and it's not going to get smaller on its own. So, we're, we're, we may, without doing anything, that gap could continue to just get bigger and bigger as well. So, it's not just stemming it now, but it's understanding that projection and, and that. We keep having more regulations foisted on us that we have to, you know, spend money on. And yeah, and I think many the one thing that we heard from the public last time is that this should not be in perpetuity, right? And so this is a single year lift. Well, it goes so it's it's a multi year, but in the first year you get the lift, and in the last five years you get whatever inflationary rate you set. And then at year six, well, during year five you have to go back out to the voters and ask for a renewal. So, Mayor French. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. I just wanted to just put in a fire quote of uh, what Deputy Nervoni said. I was on the Strong Bears meeting uh, on Tuesday, I guess it was, and similar sentiment there. Uh, we are, anytime I feel like I have concerns about situations relative to the future, when I hear their stories, I'm I'm feeling a little better about ourselves. And unfortunately, I hate to, to, to put it that way, but bluntly, some of the cities are even looking at layoffs. It's, you know, coming up uh, in this year because they're they're on the precipice. And so there are challenges there. And I think that as we go through the budget process, um, that will kind of inform our thinking about, we have to think very carefully about what the community is looking for and what we can afford. So, so remind me, I, I thought when we talked about a, a levy consultant, it was to help us identify a levy for the like from the property. Is that, did I, was I missing something? And that this is really just intended to fill our funding gap or our yeah. general fund? Yeah, that's what it was always intended to do. It was always to, intended to build a gap. So, it was not for the late. How do we think we're going to raise money for the late? Um, that's a good question. That, so, we had made Corey and Amber made the applications. I don't know, was everybody on the email? So, we're, we're getting the Aaliyah mm -hmm. funding, which was 500,000. Right. The RCO, $4 million is a no-go. Uh, we've got 2.5 million potentially from the federal government uh, that would cover the improvements to the community center. And then we've got a $2.5 million levy um, from King County that was part of this last levy that they set aside for us for trail connections that we've never been able to identify. That I reached out to the county about a month ago and we found a path where, pun intended, we can make it a link between the Burt Gilman Trail through the park and into the water trail and use that full 2.5 million. But we still got a four or five million dollar gap still. So uh, Amber and her team are looking for other options. We work with Dr. the council member Dembowski at the county level. So they'll be running another parks levy. Um, yeah, we're gonna be cobbling money together. Um, cities and municipalities, cities and other uh, entities are having trouble getting voters to increase taxes through levy lists. They don't generate a lot of money, but they represent sort of a, when you go out and say, I'm going to raise your property taxes by X amount, 
generally a large amount of money to generate enough money to get to running a million dollars a year. Um, it seems like there needs to be more effort put into what I'll call how much can we squeeze out of our budget through a process that some of these cities that have been successful with these levies like Shore, where they developed a, I forget the name of it, a public educational process to have public group go through and look at the budget and say, where can you squeeze this out? So what's the name of it? Um, well, in this community, we use financial futures, they did it. Financial, uh, no, financial sustainability task force. It's, yeah, it's like a sustainability or a financial yeah. task force that you engage with the public for a period of time. And my recollection is like the city of Sherling does that uh, a year in advance of when they're requesting their levy lift. So they can say they've engaged the public and they've gone through the budget. I'm concerned that if we don't do that kind of process, that we will get the same sort of reaction that says, well, You've got fluff in your budget and you haven't squeezed enough and you just want more money. So I will say that the deputy mayor's group, uh, some of the cities, and I can't remember which ones, had done that kind of citizen financial uh, committee. And their general sense was it didn't give them any more credibility because the, the sentiments are are affected by what people think the money's for and whether they want to say yes to it. So I will only say, I used to think that too, but on this on this last call, people were talking about the uh, fact that that now, now maybe it's still a good box to check off, but the, the thought was that it didn't give them a leg up in getting the uh, approval. So, you know, I don't see how that could not be true but uh, they were saying, well, people just said, well, we don't agree with those people who are on the committee, you know? Which I think is fine because yeah. there, will, I, there will always be people that disagree. But have we as a city gone through the public engagement process to hear from our constituents? Because their response may be no more cupcakes at any retirement parties. So the public affairs firm has, so it's a year long process. They have a timeline that is, has heavy public engagement and education within it. Um, but it is during the year before you put it on the ballot. Um, one thing that they mentioned, as we discussed with them, that you know, any time during, you know, you're not locked in through November. You can terminate the contract. If you get to June and it's like, we are not putting this thing on the ballot, um, then we're done. We, we continue to live out of reserves. It, it needs to be an education process. I understand what you're saying, and I know that uh, Kenmore did this with their financial sustainability plan. They started with a consultant. They had a, a committee, and they're the ones who keep an eye on what the consultant put together. And that may be something that Might comes be. out of this, but it's not going to be a financial sustainability plan. But I think if, if you're going to go for this and ask for renewal, in five years, um, it should have passed. You're going to want some accountability during that time. People keeping an eye on, on how those funds that were given to you to fill a hole are spent. Oh. So, calling it the public safety, that's where the shortages are coming from is public safety, or, or... I mean, the, there are biggest expense. In the general fund, they are absolutely the because largest that'll, expense. That's the question that people will ask: is where where are you short? Where are and, we short? We're short yeah. for personnel. I mean, just yeah. straight across the board. It's it's right. like seventy percent of the cost of the city is in personnel, and it is in the general fund. And so it's um, a mix of people on the city side. But like as I told you earlier, there's a disbursement of you know, kind of how those salaries are paid, you know, allocations to their funds. Police are 100% tied to the general fund. It's the only thing they can pay for them. So, yeah, yeah. I wanted to say, uh, I think we have a, we, have, we can make a fairly detailed case because of the dispatch costs, the salary increase costs, uh, other aspects of public safety. And I think that's going to be important to call out, be able to uh, address so that people don't think we're playing a shell game 
Um, but I, I do think that both the mayor and I have talked to some of our opponents from the last time around, and they have professed, at least uh, verbally, that they would be supportive and help support something that's targeted with a limited time duration. So we'll see if that comes to pass. But, uh, uh, you know, a couple of the personalities who were involved have expressed that. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, everyone will be singing you know, from the, the in book or anything. So, uh, but but I do think that that's why we need the public relations firm to help us put the best um, presentation together on why we need this. Because the why and the duration are going to be the two compelling things. That's wonderful. I would also add, so currently, the police, we've authorized them to have a plus three on hiring to preemptively account for future retirements. That is not in the budget for the next two years. And so while that is not as direct as laying anybody off, it does mean the police department will likely be shrinking. And that's something that this levy could address. Yeah, thank you. Sure. The, uh, and on point, uh, Mr. Coleman, um, we are in a place where we don't have a very deep bench anywhere. Uh, and we do have the potential for considerable retirements in other areas. And I would say that, uh, you know, what, one of the things you don't see in this budget is the nine requests we got for additional employees that operationally, I can, I can make a very strong case for it. Financially, we cannot. So uh, there, are, there are choices that we have to make. You know? And the concern to, in my mind, and I know you all share this, is that with the PD, for example, if we had a couple of folks out on medical leave again, we're right back to the same place where we've got, uh, because we don't have a deep enough bench, we're going to have challenges with scheduling and people working long hours. Because one of the things that we always have to um, manage in terms of public perception is that when uh, Prop 1 didn't pass, the city just did close its doors and, and uh, moved to the, move away. We still provided services. And so, uh, the public has to be convinced that there's value in, in a levy lift as opposed to just saying it's our opportunity that we need to do every few years when the city gets a little too high on its force. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a way for the public to say, well, maybe you need to take a new belt. I knew where to tighten the belt any tighter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I will say that the levy wasn't operational last time. It was right. it was more construction. It was new. It was new, new construction, new sidewalks was and, and evidenced by the fact that there are no new sidewalks. Yeah. Um that we did need it in order to make new sidewalks. <laughs> so three years, not any more sidewalks. Um, but I and I, I will say that you know there was a lot of pushback about, well, get rid of the fat and find a way to pay for it that way. And um, three years later, I haven't seen a plan for where the fat is either. So this is gonna be a, a, an interesting uh, educational process for our community. And it's gonna be hopefully successful, but it is listen to the community first mm -hmm. and then respond. And that's why they want the, with the, them. the research firm. Yeah. It's like, hear from the community where they really are and what they think. So council member for Tony did you have it? Oh, I was just pointing out that oh, okay. thank you. Council member Friday. Uh I think the public in Lake Forest Park is completely unaware of the crime issues that our police department is handling. The stuff that's in the administrator's report People, uh, the fact that there are incidents on a regular basis at town center, when I talk to people, they're blissfully unaware. And so I think part of the education is going to be that. And along these same lines, I think we might have to say that, especially with pr prospective retirements and so forth, and the salary competition in the region, we, we may not have the police force that we have today. Now, our police force might be unhappy to hear that, but I think we're going to have to be, because we have to have dispatch, right? So there's some things we have. We have to have jail. Uh, so we have to we have to have the court 
uh, we have to have public defenders, uh, you know. Which if that passes, we're and that one, in trouble. Yes, yeah, in trouble. That, they're, they're talking about cutting caseloads by uh, two thirds for public defenders. So, um, you know, I think that we have to do that. So do we charge fewer crimes? Do we just, you know, uh, let everything that is, a, you know, assault go by the wayside? I think I think we can lay out some of the proposals. I think what's hardest, because it will upset our police force, is to talk about the fact that we might have to reduce staffing at the police department. But that is a possibility. But you get into a safety this. issue for the yeah. officers. I mean, yeah. Just one other point, if I may, um, Mr. Chair, the, the the retention question is another one that we do deal, deal with week in week out, and without um, telling tales at a school. There is very serious concern, and we've seen this in the past, where we've lost key employees because of circumstances, but also because of financial pressures. Uh, and we're simply at this point incapable of increasing salaries to the level that some of our surrounding cities are able to are able to pay. And so we're we're at risk poaching. Uh, it's a constant discussion. I'm sure the deputy mayor's meeting is in the bulk of mayor's meetings that I go to, and and I want to make sure that we are. Um, Staying within our, our bracket of what's appropriate to keep paying for the salaries and retaining key employees. Just as a heads up, October 10th, we'll have an exciting session to talk with bargaining authority. So. I do think though the public education and understanding. What our financial situation is, it's going to be very important. Yes. I will just say that after the pandemic, during the pandemic, and following the pandemic, we asked every single department to erase every number in their budget and defend it. It went straight back to a zero-based budgeting concept. And, and, and so my point in sharing that is that when we keep talking about we need to cut the fat, we need to, to keep this down to being very lean, we're there. We, I mean, the cost of doing business as far as staff to keep the staff <laughs> healthcare, <laughs> healthcare, L and I, I mean, you name it, it's going up. It is significantly going up. The cost for everything that we touch is going up. And yet departments are still trying to do it in the same number, if not just reasonably, just slightly more. And the, the truly the cost of inflation, the cost of all of our consultants has just significantly increased. And I just want to remind everybody that when we were in the middle of this pandemic, it, it was as lean as we possibly could make it. And we're not that far out of that time frame. It feels like it was, we are, but we, we aren't. And so I just want to remind everybody that that was part of a previous, not doesn't really, it wasn't really that long ago that we did that piece together as a team in addition. It's the current budget we're in that we see right now. So. Yeah. And so I just thank you. Griff. You know, I think that it is saying that to the to the public is not a bad idea. Say, hey, you know, during the pandemic we went down to zero and everybody had to redefend their budget because you know everybody thinks that that everybody is you know not working as hard as they they are or they're not, you know, they don't realize and, and that, as well as any of the new code mandates, is very important to impress upon people that if you the surface water stuff, or you know, or any of the the things that that came down from Olympia, that we have more paperwork we have to do. Those types of things are very defendable to to someone, rather than just saying, "Oh, we need more money because." I mean, not that that's what you're doing, but it does it does logically help people understand. Yeah, just quickly, uh, uh, to, to share legal's point, 
I, I do recognize that for us who are so close to this, it's very easy to say, oh, we're as clean as possible. But demonstrating that, it, it is, I think that is imperative. We have to be able to get that message out there and say, and I'm not sure what form that looks like, honestly. There, there's a lot of different vehicles we could take, uh, paths we could take on that. But I do believe that it's sort of like, you know, we don't ever want to get in a situation of, of saying to the community, oh, trust us, we're as lean as we are, because that that's failed in the past. And so I, I take your point uh, to heart, John. I, I, we have to find a, a path that, that shows not only the education, but it helps um, bring the, the community and certain members of the community along for... Um, real understanding that they can we we get into this place six months from now they say they the council and the administration did their work that's my word yeah. and i would like to reiterate i think some people come from a maybe a more of a corporate background use it or lose it you know if you don't spend all your money this budget then you're not going to get it next budget and we don't work like that we look at you <laughs> all yeah. look at the, each line item and you really understand do we need this or not? Has the price for it increased? And it's a very methodical way of going through a budget and it's not, there's no use it or lose it in this system. If your budget needs to be bigger next set because you've got more expenses and we do that, it's less, you have less expenses and we just fluctuate with the realities that we're based with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually big swings are because there's something planned in the next five years and you're not able to do something you don't normally do. There will be some who will understand that prices are going up and that labor is a major factor of where we spend our money. Therefore, if we want to continue to have the police force that we have, the other things that we have, we need to support it. There are those that won't, won't make any difference to you. But I think it's, it's helpful to say, to look at like 10 year trends. You know, what was the FTE 10 years ago? What does that line look like? What does the police cost look like? What is it as a percentage of our overall budget? And how do we compare it to other cities? I think people can understand that if we are mid-range with all of our other cities, then maybe we can go up a little more and still be our mid-range. It's, it's when, if we somehow see that we're higher than our neighbors, but you're not gonna get support. But when you can show what is causing this imbalance and how do we compare to our neighbors? So the, the example that I've heard and, and is that, for example, schools are a reflection of their community. The community has a lot of support for their schools. They will reflect that in their schools. Same thing with their public services. You know, if you're in a community that supports public service, they will provide support for you. But they can all just say, just say, well, tight your belts. We had to do it too. Things cost twice as much as they did two years ago. So I can't spare the nickel. I really like your point of going back and looking at things. I remember the fire district looked at what is 1% per year um, and compared to other, you know, expenses and so forth. Uh, of course, they had other revenue opportunities that they could go to. Um, but I, I do think that that is an interesting concept. Like, what is, what are the costs of, what have, were our costs 10 years ago for the cost of public safety? And what are they today? Looking at all those elements, salaries and, and benefits, um, uh, court system, uh, you know, jail, uh, public defense and prosecution, dispatch, and and kind of, you know, there there is a way probably to make that picture. And then your other point of comparing it to other cities that, I guess, have their own police force, or that contract with King County, I don't sure. know. Compare us to Kenmore, they have 10 less officers and they pay the same amount to King County for police services that we pay. That's a, that's a, that's a good one, but then people would say, well, then can you have only 11 officers? <laughs> you know? No, not, not, yeah, they, they, they have, you know, they yeah, can send know. anybody from King I know, County. But, down. but I okay. think uh, Chair Lebo's point is really well taken to, to do a timeline uh, showing that. I think I think the balance that kind of with the police uh, sort of example there is with the services. <clears throat> you know, we have higher, I think we have higher response times, not response. I mean, we, we have better service. We did. Because we have 
better trained police officers with enough police officers to be able to to, to run the whole department, you know. So well, looking and, for, and that's more intangible. So yeah, just quickly on point two, the other thing is I, it, it, when you go to my office, if you look at one of my whiteboards, the the levy rate, you can compare us to Shoreline, for example. I, mean, I think they're at 1.82, we're at 0.86, I believe it is. And it's it's crazy too to think about over time that we've gone from a high of like twelve and a half percent of the total pie that goes gets paid, paid to the county and in the state, uh, or actually the county goes to the county, then down to the state, to all of us, down to a low now of eight point whatever percent. And so that has just been diving. And so the amount of revenues we're receiving from that source have just gone down tremendously with costs increasing, you know, diversity there. So I think the, it goes back to education and the way you put it together. And it's less about, you know, you want to have some key stories, but graphics tell a lot of things yeah. very quickly. When you see things are going like this, yeah. things are going like this, you can get that, you know, up on expenses is bad. <laughs> yeah, going down and, you know, that's a pretty clear. And I think people really are um, think in terms of value. And paying for this because I get the value of having police officers who are part of our community every single day. They get value in these other kinds of things. It's really convincing them that they're getting value for this. And it's measurable. It's something that they can look at five years and go, yeah, we have a great police force. They continue to do a good job. Or they've done a terrible job. Why would we continue to support them? It's something they can measure. It's yeah. not... Yeah. Something lost in the minutia. Of... And, you know, the level of crime, you know, if crime's going down, that doesn't necessarily mean it got too many officers. It may mean that community policing and alternative policing is actually improving our public safety. contract, bringing the consultants. Um, we are at 810, and I appreciate the indulgence of the company and a very good discussion, and I appreciate the further conversation because we do have, uh, as a budget cycle, a lot of big decisions to make. And, uh, the public expects us to make those decisions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Very cool to see you. Well, with that, we're adjourned.